welcome to the Born Free podcast, where we'll discuss the challenges facing the world's wildlife and ecosystems. My name's Sarah Locke and I'll be talking to the passionate people doing their bit to try and secure a future where wildlife and humans can peacefully coexist. So today we're joined by Will Travis, president of the Born Free Foundation, um, and I guess people best know you for your work in wildlife conservation. Um, but you haven't always haven't always been into wildlife conservation, have you? What were you doing right at the beginning? Not always, always, but pretty much because for the last 35 years, this is what I've done. But I actually ran a skateboard shop in Dorking in Surrey for about a year. It's hard to imagine, I know. I just honestly can't imagine it. Oh, no, God, I was so down with the kids, um, to quote David Cameron. No, not at all. Not at all. Couldn't couldn't skateboard at all. But I wanted to create uh, this safe space four kids uh, so we had a t te- i brought a tv in and we used to have sort of daytime tv going on and i got to know what a truck was and a board and all sorts of bits and, b- and my ojs what is a truck a truck is the the bit underneath that holds the wheels and and then the the ojs were the the top wheel okay that you could buy and i can't i tell you what this was like for nearly 40 years ago and to have kids come in and spend about 120 quid on a skateboard 40 years ago it's was a lot. a lot of money so you did pretty well then well uh, the shop closed okay no i was gonna <laughs> no, i was gonna ask actually no, is it still a work is it still no, alive now it's not and the local council didn't build the promised skate park so of course the 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 place where you could go and use your skateboard um, also evaporated were you asked to do that how, how did you get into that? I, I met someone in the street and he said, what are you doing? And I said, not much. And he said, do you want to run a shop? And I said, yes. And he said, OK. OK, I love that. That's a very uh, unconventional mm-hmm. like entry into mm-hmm. skateboarding yeah. and then mm-hmm. a swift exit. Uh, maybe. <laughs> OK, um, talk, speaking of unconventional um, entries, as talking about wildlife conservation, how did you get into that then? Because your mum and dad obviously starred in the film Born Free. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so... Um, uh, it, it must have been a seed that was um, germinated very, very young. Um, I went to Kenya in 1964 by ship through the Suez Canal with my mum and dad and my sister and my young brother then. I have a, had a, another brother since then. And uh, we lived in Kenya for about 10 months while the film was made. And, of course, we were surrounded by wildlife and wildlife opportunities and although I was only sort of five at the time five or six at the time uh, I was old enough to to get it I was old enough to understand what was going on and it is a sort of disease Mm. uh, but you never want to be cured you know once you've been bitten by the wildlife everyone says it and uh, the Africa bug as well yeah you just don't want to you just don't want to be cured because it's so fascinating it's so interesting uh, and the opportunities to live a different kind of life are just there. So um, so five years old, six years old in Kenya, and then travel back to Kenya in my teens. And we went on a big family safari and went up to George's camp in, in Kora National Park. Well, it's a national park now. It was Kora Reserve in Kenya at the time. Very remote, um, right off the beaten track, um, pushing our VW camper van out of the sand my dad photographing while we pushed. Um, to, Sorry, to, why did you take a VW camper van? Well, we took Isn't two... Isn't like yeah. of, all of, the, of all the vehicles? Well, it was the, it was the vehicle to hire at the time. And we did have a, a, a Range Rover as well. So there were sort of two vehicles, okay. one to pull the other out if it got stuck. Um, but of course, it was accommodation. So we slept. Some of us slept in the camper van. Some of us slept in a tent. Um, and we just had this most extraordinary, wonderful experience. We went to George Adamson's camp for Christmas. And uh, I remember, you know, my mum had somehow managed to get a turkey. Um, we're all vegetarian now and or vegan now. But at the time, and George was never going to be a vegetarian or a vegan. So there's this turkey. And she, she also managed to bring paper Christmas hats, and those things you blow to make a noise. So we have George Adamson and his brother Terence and Tony Fitzjohn and my dad and mum and the, all my siblings all sort of gathered around the table with a bit of tinsel and the hats on and blowing the whistles and carving turkey. And there's lions outside the fence. There's a sort yeah. of perimeter fence. The lions are just there kind of watching and probably thinking, hmm, well, I hope we get some. That is such a childhood. Yeah. Oh, yeah. my gosh. It was. And, and I do remember... 
They never got any of the turkey. But there was a camel that had been brought in as food. And it's a dead camel, obviously. And this camel is over there, probably about 80 meters away from the fence. And we can see it getting bigger and bigger as the gases inside mm -hmm. start to. And suddenly there's this huge explosion. Oh and it sort of almost knocks the lions out as the camel blows up. And sure. then they have their dinner. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So do you just want to quickly explain who um, George Adamson and Joy Adamson yeah. were? And Yeah. Yeah. So um, it, it goes back to the the story of Elsa the Lioness. Um, so firstly, the book, Born Free, was George's diaries turned into a book by Joy, his wife. And the amazing story was that she took the manuscript round to, I think it was 20 or more publishers and got it rejected by all of them. That's just nuts. Yeah, until one person, a lady at Collins Harville, um, read it and thought, yeah, there's something in this. And of course, you know, it went on to sell 20 million copies in its first year and it was translated into you know dozens of languages and multiple reprints and then there was um the living free which was the follow-up and then there was forever free which was the the third in the sequence and uh i mean the story of elsa must be one of the most famous yeah it is animal stories of all time yeah i think it is i think if we're looking for iconic animals yeah. in people's lives you know there's flipper the dolphin yeah who died in Rico Barry's arms, which turned Rico Barry from a dolphin trainer into a dolphin activist. There's there's Elsa and her story, her amazing story from an orphaned lion cub going back to the wild and being successful and having cubs of her own and then dying at a, a relatively early age, but inspiring, you know, there was the books, then there was the film, then was the TV series, then there's the foundation. Yeah. And Christian as well, the lion, who we yes. can get onto later, but he's like another, he's another one, another and, iconic, and Poli Poli, yeah. the elephant. You know, there are there are these iconic individual animals, and and Born Free is very much about the individual, you know, individual people and individual animals doing great things. So your mum and dad starred um, in the film that, um, and they portrayed George and Joy Adamson, mm -hmm. and then that went on to inspire. Born Free Foundation as we know today. How did that come about? How did the two It things... took a long time from the film to the foundation. It mm -hmm. took 20 years between the two. So it was a it was an evolution of thought. But already, having made the movie, Mum and Dad had changed their views about, you know, animals in captivity. For example, you know, there were 20 odd lions used in the making of Born Free, and all bar three of them went to zoos and safari parks afterwards. That was a deal done by the producers. And when mum and dad went to see them in some of those captive conditions, you know, the, 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 the difference between the animal that they had known in Kenya and this animal now living in, a, in an enclosure surrounded by steel fencing was so profound. And I remember my dad, the first film he ever made himself, the first documentary he ever made himself was called The Lions Are Free. And there's a sequence in that filmed in a zoo. And there's that crowd of people around the lion enclosure, the lion cage at the time. And the narrative, the script that my mum reads is, you know, we can learn as much about men by studying them in their prison cells as we can studying lions in a zoo. And I think that's kind of sums it up we've got to move away from that and that's what born free has been trying to do ever since it was formed but it wasn't formed because of a lion it was actually formed because of an elephant mm -hmm. um in the late 60s mum and dad again made a feature film this time about elephants and it was a sort of family comedy but the central elephant character poli poli which means slowly slowly in swahili uh was on her way to the London Zoo as a gift from the Kenya government. And the film kind of waylaid that for about eight weeks. And at the end of filming, they said to the authorities, look, please, can we have this little elephant? Because Daphne Sheldrick and her late husband, David Sheldrick, could release this animal into mm -hmm. the wild. They were confident that they could do it. And the government said, yes, but we will go and capture another baby elephant from the wild. And the thought of doing that, the thought of a of an elephant family having a baby torn away and taken off into slavery, I can really think of no better word, was so 
um, profound was so unacceptable that they said, okay, well, enough. And Poli Poli went to the London Zoo, where about uh, 12 years later, 13 years later, we heard that she'd become impossible to manage, that she was difficult and dangerous. She was on her own. I know. Uh, uh, so uh, was, she, was, she, was she becoming difficult? What were they I think doing she with was, the, they, I think the thing is, you know, with um, elephants are social animals. They live in families, and and females in particular kind of never really break away from the family group mm -hmm. unless the whole um, herd splits. And she was on her own, and so she was becoming, I think, mentally damaged by the situation. I saw her myself, you know, rocking from side to I side. I was going to ask, did you see her yourself? I did. I went to see her several times in the zoo and anyway after a lot of pressure the zoo agreed that they while they wouldn't send her back to Africa which is what we were advocating they would send her to Whipsnade where there was at least there were other elephants that move did not succeed uh, she damaged a foot and a week later they examined her under anesthetic and she then apparently lost the will to live and they euthanized her in the house, in the elephant And house. I've seen the pictures of that and it's quite horrific. It is she's quite sort horrific. Of, she's lying down, isn't she? She's got her trunk over mm -hmm. the fence. Yeah. yeah. And it's... actually they brought in the Marines to try and, and they jack tried her to up. Jack, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, and how, it's old, how, old, how old was she? She was uh, about uh, 14. Which is not old at all. No, well, 14 no. is the same. And you think, of, think of elephants like people. Yeah. It's a 14-year-old girl. 14, 15 year old girl that's in this situation and she's deprived of family and friends and any sense of Shipped normality. Shipped over to the UK. At the age of two. Yeah. How know. long did that, how long did that journey, would that journey have taken? Well, if I mean, because that in itself must have been Well, it must have been horrific. horrendously uh, traumatic. Well, if they, if it was done by air, it would be a few hours um, and she was small enough. It was done, if it was done by ship, it would take weeks. And, and at that time, elephants were shipped around the world all the time. It was pretty grim. So it was a number of kind of um, individual animals um, and your and your parents' kind of relationship with them that really spurred on the, the beginnings of the thought process that something has to change here. And that was kind of how it started. And it started with zoo check. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, well, that's, that's I... right because it was the it was poly poly in the zoo, mm -hmm. and then it was the question: Well, what on earth's going on with zoos? That got us thinking: Well, what is going on with zoos, and who is looking at that? And we found that there was no independent body that was actually scrutinising zoos. There was some legislation, um, and local authorities were responsible for certain activities, but actually as it were an independent group looking at what's going on in zoos and calling into question what they saw and responding to the public because the public were just at the point where they were seeing enough of natural behavior of wildlife on television for example i was going to ask you it's quite a pivotal moment wasn't it it really? was it, there was a there was a series at, at the time called the world the world about us or the world around us I can't remember which on BBC two and that was the first time that you had this sort of every week there was another amazing episode which showed you something that you honestly had no clue about before it was the start of what now is life on earth the sort of the Attenborough yeah. you know fantastic Attenborough shows Plan our planet and it really changed people's attitudes so that when they went to the zoo and they saw an animal pacing backwards and forwards or the polar bear in London sort of head twisting and diving and head twisting and diving yes there were still people saying you know the bear's dancing but there were also people saying bear's sick and once we'd started zoo check we got asked a, a very simple question which is if you're not in favor of zoos what are you in favor of because they wanted to see something that offered hope and the hope was um, we want to see wildlife in its natural habitat with all the challenges that that represents so it was keep wildlife in the wild which is now our our motto um, and not in a zoo and that's the been part of the shift in public attitudes, which I think is more advanced in the UK than many, many countries. I think we are well down the track of rejecting the sort of traditional concept of animals in captivity in the UK. After all, we're we're on the cusp of officially ending the use of wild animals in circuses. Which is fantastic. And um, there's a really lovely story, if I got this right, that you each put in a pound. You, oh, yeah. your mum, <laughs> yes. you, your mum and your dad. Is that well, right? Yeah, actually, there were three, three, three more people. So okay. uh, Bill George and Dorian Gray and Jill Fudakowska and my mum, my dad, myself. 
we all put in a pound. So the starting capital for our little not-for-profit, which was Zoocheck, was mm-hmm. six pounds. Amazing. I love yeah. that. And your mum still goes and does that, doesn't she? She is goes still very zoos. much... Um, she yeah. does. Because she, she's, she's fascinated by, you know, the individual and she's torn by the plight of animals in captivity and in zoos. So she never wants to lose touch with why it started it still fires her engine it still gets her you know emotionally involved and also now after so long she's got a lot of technical knowledge and understanding so when she sees something she sees it as almost as if she's a a vet you know she understands the behavior she understands the physical problems the enclosure design and the faults in the enclosure design and the lack of space and the lack of companions and the lack of social context she she gets all of that Mm -hmm. Uh, and so she's able to be again our eyes and ears that take us into that space and explain it for us yeah are there any other um rescues that really stand out for you maybe not the earliest ones but are there others along the way because obviously born free has done you know and continues to do mm. so um I and mean, we're looking at the rescue of four lion cubs this year aren't we yeah at um, least yeah, yeah at if least. Not more. um <laughs> but i mean yeah are there any from the past that kind of really stick out for you um i think i think the one the two that stand out for me and there are as you say there have been so many But the two that stand out for me are the dolphin rescues that we Mm -hmm. did in the early 1990s. So in the 70s, there were a couple of dozen different dolphin shows in the UK, in Dolphin area. It was in Brighton, wasn't there? Brighton, uh, Clacton Pier, all sorts of places. There was one at the Raymond Review Bar in London, which was a nightclub, a strip club, basically. And they had the dolphins in a tank on stage and the girls would swim in the tank with fish paste um, smeared onto their costume. So the dolphin would remove the costume. That is just ridiculous in so yes. many in so many yeah, ways ridiculous so and wrong. horrific <laughs> so in, wrong I, yeah wow but but by the 90s by the late 80s that the number of facilities with dolphins had fallen to four mm-hmm. and we were involved in the closure of two of the last four uh we took a dolphin from Morecambe uh to the caribbean mm-hmm. and we took two dolphins from Brighton to the Caribbean, so Rocky, Silver, and Missy. And uh, I remember, you know, one of the strange, bizarre highlights of that was was hiring uh, a 707 to fly the only direct flight that I believe had taken place, at least up until that time, between the UK and the Turks and Caicos Islands, which is where we took them Mm -hmm. ultimately. And they were um, there for about six months in a large sea pen, huge sea pen, 80-acre sea pen, and where they were taught to catch live yeah, fish again. Yeah, I was going to say, how do you teach? How do you teach an animal? Well, to, you have to, to deprogram fish, the animal that has been programmed now to eat dead fish. So dolphins don't usually scavenge dead fish; they they uh, yeah. hunt live prey. So the uh, I asked, or I, I think I asked um, David Taylor, the sort of famous zoo vet, how do you? sort of keep a dolphin in captivity and apparently what you do is is a bit like what they do with elephants you break its spirit so you drain the pool until it's just in a foot of water so it can't swim away and then grab it and then you you force feed it dead fish and after you've done that for a week the dolphin being an intelligent animal just goes i give up i'll do it you want me to eat dead fish that's what i'll do but of course if that dolphin has now lived in captivity for 20 years, as some of the dolphins we took back to the Turks and Caicos had, you have to break that cycle. So then you take a long time reverting to natural behavior and getting the dolphins to speed swim, build up muscle tone, Mm -hmm. catch live fish. And then ultimately you reach a point where you say, is there more we can do for this dolphin or is this dolphin as ready as he or she will ever be? And they have to take their chances. And, you know, I've always subscribed to the view that if you've done everything you can, ultimately you give that animal a chance and they hopefully will survive. And if they don't, you've done everything you possibly can. I actually cannot believe that that's how they uh, train them to eat dead fish. Mm -hmm. I had no idea about that. That's Mm -hmm. really quite barbaric. Pretty grim. Yeah, that's horrific. Um, And then what happened to those? um, Did you ever like... 
did you ever know what happened to those dolphins afterwards? Yeah. I guess yeah. for well, some time afterwards. What did you have we did or? is we put well, we didn't have trackers at the time. What we did is we put a, a freeze brand on the dorsal fin. Now I'm I'm told that it's painless. Mm -hmm. I have to believe that it's painless. Um, it's a temporary mark on the dorsal fin because the skin sloughs off naturally. So after six months, you will not see whatever the design is that you've put on the dorsal fin. Uh, and then we had sightings of those dolphins. We talked to local fishermen yeah. and we said, look, if you ever see a dolphin, look for the dorsal fin, tell us if it's... A so we had sightings for about six months afterwards. If those dolphins were going to die, they'd die within two weeks. You know, if they were unable to catch live fish, they'd yeah, die true, within two actually. or three weeks. Yeah, and if they're there for six months, they've, they've got past that and then they can take their chances with wild dolphins. And I guess you had to kind of change their relationship that they had with humans... Yeah, to try and l luckily Just at the at time. Hands off. Yeah, but at the time, the Turks and Caicos Islands was was not a sort of top tourist destination as it is now. Those those seas were very empty and very open, and actually very beautiful. So I hope that those dolphins had some more years at least uh, living a wild life. Yeah, that's amazing. So, um, how do you think like the challenges that you faced when you first started Zoo Check, and in comparison to the Born Free that we have you have today, what how do you think those main challenges have really changed? Well, when we started Zuchik, of course, our focus was very narrow. We were looking mm -hmm. at captive situations and commenting on captive situations, uh, commenting to the government. I mean, one of the things that we did in those early years was um, we went to the European Commission and we had a discussion with them about zoos in Europe. And they said, well, you know, you have to bring us some data and some evidence to support your assertion that there should be a common directive. I mean, the thing we were trying to get across was if you've got an animal that lives, say, in the UK, where the legislation was relatively modern mm -hmm. and up to date, but that that animal could go to a country in Europe where the legislation and therefore the protections were far weaker, there was nothing to stop it. There was no way that you could say, no, you can't send this animal from here in this relatively better situation to here where it's grim because there was no commonality. And the only way to get commonality was to have a European zoos directive. So we, this is what we were putting to, to the European Commission. They then said, go off and do it. And they gave us a bit of money, not very much. And it was extremely difficult to get the payments. But we eventually got the money. We have did this survey. And before we did the survey, the, the list of zoos in Europe, if I remember rightly, was about 256 zoos. When we finished, we'd found 1,007. Wow. And we knew that that was still only a fraction of the total. There's about 3,000 zoos in the European Union, including the UK. But the commissioner at the time was an Italian called Carlos Ripidimiana. He signed into law the European Zoos Directive. And it's not perfect, but it does mean that every zoo in the European Union has to be licensed and the terms of the license require the zoo to sort of look after its animals properly and to have some sense of education and some sense of conservation. So I think, you know, on a list of achievements, I think one of the one of the biggest achievements, the most profound achievements mm -hmm. that we've had is the European Zoo's Directive. No, absolutely. And so today, what do you what does most of your work compromise of? What's a day to day in the life of Will Travis? Would you say? That's quite a big question. It's, it's very diverse. <laughs> well, it, well it's, I think it's one of the things that still keeps me, you know, getting up in the morning is that after 35 years, I'm not actually, actually sure what the day will hold. I never know what telephone call I might get, what email I might get. You know, it could be an investigative journalist in Southern Africa who has uncovered something and wants support or advice or whatever. It could be somebody wants a speech and they want or they want a, a policy position a school or a university, want to talk, uh, a radio show. I was doing Radio 4, um, the Today program mm -hmm. with John Humphreys um, about trophy hunting only a short while ago. It's, it's so diverse. It's so interesting. And the fantastic thing that I think we have now at Born Free is it's not just like, like me and three people trying to cover everything we have we have people who do conservation or experts in conservation mm -hmm. experts in policy experts in animal welfare we have a communications team who can get the message out and can ultimately the thing we have to do is to change public attitudes because it's only a change in public attitudes that will bring about the change we wish to see yeah and how do you how do you find that you best go about that i mean i know that you're very active on social media 
Um, and I guess that's one way to raise awareness. Um, do you just want to talk a little bit about that? Because I feel like personally, a, a, quite a big bit of your role is inspiring younger generations and people to go into wildlife conservation. So do you want to just talk a little bit about the role that you mm. think social media has? To play? Well, I struggle a bit with social media, but thank goodness I have some help <laughs> uh, to, to make it happen. Because uh, seriously, it is, a, it is generally a, a a younger person's um, area of conversation and communication. But I'm getting a bit better at it. You know, I have a, a Twitter um, account. I have an Instagram account. Um, I have a rather sluggish Facebook account. And it's an opportunity to have conversations. I, I really feel that social media needs to be social. It needs to be not just what I want to say. It needs to reflect what other people are thinking, feeling, are excited about, are anxious about, are um, happy about, are sad about. And so m my social media is quite broad in its, in its content. Um, I have a particular dislike and I think this is an area that we need to get to to grips with. I have a particular dislike for the what I call the selfish selfie. Yeah, that's kind of what I wanted to get. Yeah, onto, it's really. uh, you know, it's that the the hunter standing beside the dead carcass of the animal that he or she has killed. It's the person who's gone to some live animal facility and is yeah, cuddling see, a baby tiger. Uh, I think it's like less mad. than, I mean, the trophy hunting is obviously just barbaric and horrible, but it's almost the more complex is those selfish selfies that people don't even realize are selfish yeah. when they're holding a snake that they think is from like a rehabilitation center or whatever. But mm. the whole point is that, you're getting people to take a photo with a captive animal, I guess. Well, it's like the it's like the a good example which takes it right through that whole process is is the cant hunting yeah. scenario in South Africa, where you have lion cubs taken away from their mothers at a few days. Mm -hmm. Th these aren't abandoned; they are physically removed. And then you have volunteers, um, usually Western gap year students, who go down and pay money to look after these little orphaned cubs for uh, uh, some months until they're perhaps about sort of four or five months old. And then they're getting a bit too big to handle. And then they go into the, the sort of walking with lions program uh, where at the age of five, six months, up to maybe a year, people pay more money to go and walk with them for an hour or two in the bush. And then they're too big for that. Then it becomes kind of too dangerous, and, and I'm sure insurance wouldn't cover it. Insurance companies should look at this, by the way. And, and then they go into either a kind of holding pattern where they're brought on until they're old enough literally to be executed and their bodies are then shipped their body parts are then shipped to the far east for traditional med medicinal purposes or the more magnificent of them are offered at a discount to trophy hunters on what i believe they call a no kill no fee basis in other words the animal has no chance of escape you do not pay in. it's completely fenced in and if you don't kill the animal you don't have to pay but of course you're going to kill the animal yeah. Um, and it's pretty it's pretty horrendous and that is exploitation of a of a lion cub from birth right. to death yeah through the very and actually we had beth jennings on um earlier like a few weeks ago to talk about the claws out campaign which is mm. obviously really key to that something so, we totally yeah. support no absolutely um but i guess so how do people know whether something is animal exploitation on social media so because I, I guess you know people don't know the whole story that's the whole point isn't it is that when you go and pet that lion club cub at the time you're told a completely different story mm -hmm. so what are the key things that people should really be looking out for well, I think you need to do your research really carefully. I mean, there are now a growing number of websites that evaluate these volunteering experiences. So, so go and check mm -hmm. out those sites and see what the reviews are. You know, follow people like Beth Jennings so that you understand what the pitfalls are, what to look out for. Because she started thinking this was going to be, you know, a wonderful opportunity for her to give back. And then she found out that it was she was being exploited as, almost as much as the animals. So be, I would always err on the side of caution I would I would if anything's to do with captivity if anything's to do with baby animals touching if, and petting touching and petting I think you've got to start to think whether this is for real or not yeah so I guess because we're always talking about the younger people that want to go into wildlife conservation mm. that want to um that want to give back um you're someone who obviously didn't go to uni and now you're you know where you are and obviously you have such a like a unique 
um, story to that, but what would be your advice? What would you give to younger younger people that want to go into wildlife conservation now? I, I think that there is a there is a bit of a danger that one thinks you can only contribute in an effective way if you've been through university, got your degree, got your master's, gone for your PhD, whatever. And I think there's there's absolutely masses of room for that. But I also think that there's room for what I would call the advocates, um, the people who are... Gerald Durrell was a naturalist. Mm. He wasn't an academic. And I guess I'm a naturalist. I'm not an academic. I, 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 if someone asked me to, you know, design some program which has got lots of statistics and stuff in it, I'm, yeah, I'm not going to be able to do it. But the good thing is, I know people who can help me. I know people who can. So uh, I think um, follow your heart, follow your passion. If you really care about a particular, I was reading something the other day about uh, a young lady who decided that. Protecting cheetahs was the thing. That's what she that wanted to thing. do. And so she upsticks and she moved to Botswana and she's resident in Botswana. And now she does and is probably extremely um, well qualified to do uh, cheetah conservation and conflict mitigation. Mm -hmm. So protecting livestock from cheetah and vice versa. So I think follow your passion, follow your heart. There is room for people who you know don't have the numbers and letters after their name. I think it's quite an entrepreneurial spirit as well. I feel like you're always really good at seeing something so random that someone does and you know how to kind of like link that in with wildlife and what we, I feel like you're always really good at. It's, you know, something, I mean, but I don't have any experience anyway, but I mean, I it's the kind of thing that I probably don't see the link between, but you, you kind of are quite good at picking that up on. It might just be, it might just be longevity. I, I mean, having done it for so long, I, I can see um, a, perhaps a slightly broader landscape. Mm -hmm. And then I see an opportunity. I see a person and I see what they care about and I see what their passion is. And I've got a very wide palette that I can then say, ah, they wouldn't fit in here or here, but actually there's two or three different opportunities over here. That's where um, I would recommend that they go and they do a bit of exploring. And also people do come to Born Free. They come and spend some time working at Born Free or, or volunteering at Born Free or, or doing some you know, research work for us. And that allows them. I think it's important to understand that when you say you, know, you work for a wildlife organization, that does not mean you're on safari 12 months mm. a year. You know, you know, we mm -hmm. sit behind desks a lot. We hit typewriters. No, they're not called that anymore. <laughs> we hit keyboards. We hit keyboards. I've definitely never even seen, <laughs> seen a typewriter. A typewriter. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm, I'll Google it later. Like, I'm sure Shut I'm up. I up actually it. started, I, um, I'll tell you a story about a typewriter. When... Uh, George Adamson, I'll tell you two stories quickly. Oh, when good. George Adamson um, came over to Europe, I think it was for the first time in like 20 years mm. to go and have an eye operation uh, in Austria. He then came on and he lived with us for a month uh, in my dad's house, my dad's house in Surrey. And um, the purpose for that was that he would record conversations with my dad, which would become his book, My Pride and Joy. Oh, yeah. That's how the book was created. So after a month, there were literally piles and piles of tapes, cassettes. Oh, you probably God. don't remember those either. But, um, and they all had to be transcribed. And so we transcribed them onto a manual typewriter. And every time you made a mistake, you had to get that little bit of Tipex paper and pop it in and hit it and take out the mistake and put in. Seriously, it is, I don't even know how people did that, but but we did. But the, the patience. The patience is extraordinary. But the funny bit is, or the amusing bit at least, is when George arrived at the house mm. in his brown tweed suit with his pipe, my dad said, uh, oh, George, it was about five o'clock. He said, uh, George, would you like a whiskey? And I don't think George has ever turned down a whiskey. So uh, he said, well, yes, please. So dad's getting him a whiskey. And then we realized that George has never seen color TV. What? So and it's only fairly, you know, it was only been going for about eight or ten years in the UK. So we have a color TV. So dad sits him down in a chair with his whiskey and turns on the color tv first time george has seen color tv up comes this image and it's des o'connor who was a famous who is a famous entertainer and matt monroe singing born free 
and you kind of the hair, even now the hairs on the back of my neck just go up because how can that happen no. George has never seen color tv hasn't been in the UK for 20 years comes to our house to write a book about his life and born free and turns on the tv and they're singing oh, born I love free. That. That's it's like amazing yeah that is amazing is that one of your favorite memories of george it is yeah. absolutely one of my favorite memories of george oh that's fantastic just what an inspiration totally yeah totally no that is incredible and he lived the life you know uh, you you asked me earlier about you know how do you get into the business and all the rest of it george just sort of lived the dream he said this is what i'm going to do and i'll do it whatever and what happened was People, hundreds of people a year used to make almost a pilgrimage to his camp in the middle of nowhere to spend a day, two days, three days with George just to see if some of that magic might rub off on them. Because he was a guy who had found a kind of peace that I think we all search for. And the world gets crazier and crazier and we crave some sense of purpose and peace. And he had found it. And you um, still get to go back to Kenya quite a bit. Um, and you visit, you've been, it's in Cora, right? Yes. Am I right in saying mm -hmm. that? And it, what kind of, how does that um, resonate with you when you go? Does Do you come back feeling, you know, a lot more invigorated? Well, inspired. Yeah, inspired. Well, I haven't been to Cora for a while because Cora has been um, a slightly sort of off the beaten track part of Kenya. But it's right next door to Meru National Park. And in Meru National Park, Born Free has a, an ongoing lion project, which is, you know, now been running for several years. Uh, it's looking at the number of lions in the park and the security of lions in the park and the surrounding areas, what conflict might exist with uh, livestock and local communities and how we can, with our colleagues and friends at the Kenya Wildlife Service, how we can mitigate that. But I intend to go to Cora next year. Um, I want to go to where his camp is. It's, it was burnt down, but it's been restored. Hardly anybody goes to the park. There's no real tourist infrastructure of any kind. The road network is, is pretty ropey. But there is this amazing rock behind the camp, rather crudely called uh, the Cora Tit, because it's a rock with a smaller rock on top. And and uh, actually, that's where Christian the lion was introduced to boys. So Christian the lion was a lion that was born in Ilfracombe Zoo, went to Harrod's pet department, was bought from the pet department by two Australians, um, Ace and John, taken to their furniture shop in the King's Road. My dad goes into the furniture shop to buy a desk. They see him take him downstairs Wait, so they didn't even i didn't realize that he sort of turned up he just turned up coincidentally completely stop he That's just walked amazing. in they had a shop called sophisticat and he thought well, i'm going to see if they've got a Obviously. desk went in and they said oh your bill and we've got something interesting downstairs to show you and i think he thought oh maybe it's a desk went down it's a lion so long story short christian yeah. came to our house in in the country for four months we built him an enclosure and meanwhile, dad negotiated with the Kenya government that Christian could go back to Kenya and be released by George into the wild. And that the, a film would be made of, of the whole story. Um, and you can get that film, you know, Christian the and Lion. he was released, wasn't he? He was successfully, successfully successfully released into the wild. And then there is this extraordinary yeah, just sequence say. where Ace and John, who'd left and came back like almost a year later, and they want to see if they can find Christian. And there, there is this shot of George up on these amazing rocks. Mm. And Christian is starting to walk down and there's Ace and John down here. And you can tell there is that little moment where this could go so terribly wrong. Did they kind of cool him down? Yeah, and he they recognized... were going. And as they got closer, yeah. I think he recognized them and recognized their voices. And then he breaks into a run and then he literally sort of launches himself yeah, and we on, uh, on Ace and John. And it's, it's called The Reunion and it is one of the most viewed YouTube clips of all time. It probably will stay. I hope it stays one of the, the yeah. most... Um, viewed because it's just beautiful and I guess as well that resonates so well with Poli Poli's story because your mum and dad went back and she stretched her trunk out didn't she when yeah, she so was the in zoo. London Zoo yeah. and that picture is really quite stunning as well it is and, and I, well, I've got to be cautious here because you know we don't want people to no. be cuddling lions or whatever or re reaching out to elephants mm -hmm. or any anything of the kind but I think it sort of tells us something about 
the emotional intelligence of animals mm -hmm. that we otherwise would dismiss. And I, th I think if you look at the body of research that people like Jane Goodall have done and Baruti Galdikas and Diane Fossey and Cynthia Moss and Joyce Poole mm -hmm. and Winnie Kiru and others have done, Nora and uh, Katito in Amboseli have done over so many years. What they've done is they've broken down this artificial barrier of intellect and intelligence, sort of there's us. And then there's everything else. The more research we do, the more like us, the more of an animal we are, in a sense, and the more of a human emotion they are. Mm. So animals do grieve. They do uh, have joy and sadness and remorse and regret and all these emotions that we put human words to. And, of course, they probably call it something else. But they are similar to our own. Yeah. And I think we... We ignore that at our peril. I think it's when it, it, an example of that is the trophy hunter sees an animal as a both a victory and a commodity. A victory because he or she can kill it and a commodity because they can stick the head on a wall. They want to ignore. They don't want to acknowledge the individual and the individual's emotions and the impact on the family or the herd or the group that's left behind. They don't want to acknowledge that because the moment you start to do that, you must surely doubt the validity of what you're doing. You cannot be a humane being if you ig ignore all of that. Do you think it's ignorance? Do you think people don't realize? Or do you think it's just a case that they're actively choosing to? I think it's willful in many cases, but I think there are people on a journey and people who did not understand and then do understand. And once the, the light bulb has gone off, it really is impossible um, to change. I've got a very good friend who lives in California who has an elephant sanctuary, uh, Ed Stewart. Um, and he and his late partner, Pat, um, set up, used to work in the circus, for goodness sake. Oh, really? She used to be a tiger tamer and I think he was a camel trainer. Mm. And suddenly that light bulb went off and they set up the Performing Animal Welfare Society. They now have a beautiful place for elephants and other rescued animals. And, you know, they will fight tooth and nail to end the use of wild animals in circuses, having been part of the industry. Yeah. Um, so what, I guess, just finishing up, um, so what are the main accomplishments that you're most proud of, either personally or professionally? Uh, I think the the European Zoos Directive was a highlight, getting that in, because everyone said it couldn't be done. And it took, we started that work in 1987, and it happened in 2002. So that's 15 years. I also think bringing about an end to the use of wild animals in circuses in the UK, I started working that on 1994, and it's coming in in 2019. So that's 25 years. My my regret is that everything takes so long. Mm -hmm. um, and I know it's the same regret that my dad had. You know, he was a founder of Born Free in 1984 and he died in 1994. And I know that he thought, oh, if only I'd started this like 10, 15 years so earlier. And I do think we've got to find ways of accelerating our activities, not just Born Free's activities, mm. but I think of people like Bella Lack, who's yeah. one of our junior ambassadors, a fantastically articulate uh, young lady, 16 years old, um, with a big social media following. Yeah, we uh, have her on one of the podcasts, actually. Um, and honestly, I mean, I felt not intimidated, but just very aware that she's just so articulate. She is. She is Special just individual. So yeah, really inspirational. But if we, if we go down sort of Route 101 and we say, well, yeah, but it's going to take 25 years for this to be solved and 30 years for this. To be It'll be too late. Mm. Um, I think what Bella is and Greta Thunberg and others are drawing to our attention is that this is not something that we have time to play around yeah. with anymore. If we're going to conserve the natural world in all its splendor and diversity, then we have to do something about it now. And we have to invest in it. Maybe we actually have to step away from the commercialization side of the natural world. And maybe we have to invest because we care 
rather than because we can make money out of it. Yeah, I was going to ask you, I mean, because you've just come back from CITES, um, and I was going to ask you about the notion of like putting a value on something that I know that you personally feel like we, sh- you know, we should intrinsically putting a val- be putting a value in our wildlife and, you know, flora and fauna purely because they exist. You know, we have like an, a moral obligation. How do you kind of find the the balance between so many others and I guess the realization that you know other people want have to put a value on like priorities? I guess it's all about conservation priorities, isn't it? It is, and it's, but I mean, CITES, the, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, is a trade convention, mm. and in a sense, it's there to try and mitigate the impact of trade on wild species, plant or animal, that are in trade. I think we need something more than that. I think we need a truly global conservation treaty that understands how important it is for us to invest in the uh, the target is 17% of the planet. The 17% of the yeah. planet that we believe is the minimum we need to truly represent biodiversity on Earth. Mm-hmm. Now, if we are happy as a species here in the UK to spend, some say now, £70 billion pounds on a rail link, on an improved rail link between London and Birmingham, our second biggest city, which will shave 20 minutes off the journey time between those cities. If we're happy to spend 70 billion on that, please don't begrudge us the few billion, probably four or five billion necessary to really make an impact in terms of protecting the natural world. It's not too big a price to pay. No, you're right. Um, and so if you could, if you could pick like two or three key objectives for wildlife, for wildlife protection, uh, maybe in the UK or elsewhere that you would ask, you know, people like Boris Johnson, Theresa Villiers to look into in the next few years, what would they be? Uh, I would hope that all our political leaders from whatever yeah. persuasion would, uh, first of all, make the investment necessary in our natural world. Secondly, move us rapid as rapidly as possible away from a carbon-based economy and thirdly i think we need to establish something called world heritage species we have world heritage sites but i think we need world heritage species because i think then the entire international community can come together Mm -hmm. around a species like the gorilla the chimpanzee the lion the tiger and wherever that species is in trouble it now becomes united nations responsibility to protect it and to save it and to make sure it's there for future generations i think those and that's about individual yeah, animals that. yeah as well as the species and the habitat as a whole it's everything from the smallest to the greatest i think if we did that the world would the natural world would stand a fighting chance you need to trademark that it's a good idea um okay so um you've had 35 years of born free what does the next 35 years look like do you hope well i will tell you exactly what the next 35 years looks <laughs> like okay it looks like the you. bella the bellas it look, well it Greta's. does it, yeah you're 25 mm-hmm. uh, i started this work when i was 24 um, I've had an incredible uh, run at it. Um, I still think there's plenty of gas left in the tank, but I feel like we need to prepare to hand the baton over to the next generations. Mm-hmm. We need to give them the tools, the support, the infrastructure, the finance, the resources, the intellectual and emotional capacity to drive this thing forward. And the great news for everybody is that we're seeing signs of that, whether it's through the climate strikes, the school I strikes, I definitely whether it's- I think there yeah. is the eco-activism, the eco-activists of the, yeah. the world today are wildly, I mean, I think they're doing- Extinction yeah, Rebellion. 100%. Greta crossing the the Atlantic by boat, by boat um, Bella making a series with you know top biologists which she's currently engaged in I can't say too much mm. but it's and I think it's, the fear of the opposition that they then come up with people like Greta you know she's having to deal with so many you know proponents that, that disagree with her and I think she, you know the fact that she's holding so strong and just shows what an impact these people young people are making. Absolutely. And I I was lucky enough to be at an event only a few nights ago where Bella got up on the stage and and spoke. And she did. I don't know if she's done it with you, but she played this the sound of a of a bird that is the The last, last the last male singing and calling for the female that will never come. And she says that's the sound of extinction. And at the end of that little tiny speech, three minutes long, four minutes long, 
everyone stood. Yeah. There was an absolutely unanimous uh, standing ovation for her. And I think the more we champion the Bellas and the Gretas and the Sarahs of this world to get out there and do what needs to be done with our support, not holding them back because we're the, the generation that knows, but we are the generation that can pass on what we've learned and you can do something better with it. Thank you very much, Will. What a great way to end. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Born Free podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch the episodes, follow us on social media, or head to our website, bornfree.org.uk. My name's Sarah Locke, and our producer's Philip Fortuna. See you next time. Thank you.